now on recording and uh, I'm going to also be muting everybody. If I can find that. This is one second. Yeah, here we go. Okay, I'm muting everybody. If you want to speak from this point on, you will, you will be able to by unmuting yourself. We are now muted. Okay. All right. I see you now, Neil. Yes. Okay. Um, we're about to start. I, I would like to mention that because we're getting close to Pesach, if you have Pesach questions, what I'd like you to do is email me in advance so that I can research any of the issues you have if that might need more intense source material, and I'll be happy to answer them on next week's shear. If today, at the end of the shear, there are any uh, basic questions, I'll be more than happy to try to address as many of them as I can. You're going to have to unmute yourself at that particular time. Uh, we're ready to start the shear tonight, and uh, if anybody would like to sponsor any shear, please let me know. We're more than available for sponsorships in order to dedicate in someone's memory or for some particular simcha and so on and so forth. We are going to be showing a, a screen now. I'm going to be sharing the, the screen that shows Sukkim of the, of the Parsha. Starting with the beginning of Parsha's Ki Tisa. All right. At this particular sedra, uh, both sides, this particular sedra is so full of very important issues we could really spend a very, very, very long time discussing this particular sedja. I'd like to make mention of the following fact. There are, in this week's sedja, a total of 139 psukim. 139 psukim in this week's sedja. Now, there are seven aliyos, seven aliyot in the sedja. We call up seven people on Shabbos. However, even though we're calling up seven people on Shabbos and there are 139 psukim, which means we have approximately 140 psukim, right? That means we could give 20 psukim to each individual and we'd have seven times 20, which would equal 140 psukim. That would sort of balance out the entire parsha of 20 or so psukim per individual. You could, you could give one 25, another one 15, and so on and so forth, but it would be somewhere around 20. And in fact, in most circumstances, when you look at the parsha breakdown, it's pretty even, generally. Between the parsha, we find that when you have a leos, you know, the alias usually are approximately similar one to the other in length, generally. Not always, but generally. This sedja is an anomaly. It's so skewered and out of balance, it almost is crying out for an explanation. Let me include you into this. There are, as we said, 139 psukim, right? In the first two aliyos, which you would expect would be no more than 40 psukim, there are actually 91 psukim, which means you're left with approximately 50 psukim for the next five aliyos, no more than 10 per aliyah. It's that skewered. Why is this sedra so unusually imbalanced that the first two aliyos should have 91 psukim and all the other aliyos have no more than 10, some even less? Why, is the, why was it done like that? Now, when we, when we study the Torah, so what we have a tendency to do is we, we learn the Torah and we analyze psukim. We analyze words. We take a look at syntax. 
we take a look at the grammar, the message, the trup, the annotation, the way the psukim are broken up, the different grammatical forms of the words. That's what we generally do. But you should know there's another thing we should do. We have to look at the big picture. The big picture in this week's century is awesomely instructive because of the way the Torah treats the different aliyos and the sensitivity the Torah wants to teach us that we're supposed to have for other human beings. And let me explain. In this week's sedra, at the middle of the sedra, we are speaking about the golden calf. Now, I'm going to speak a little bit later about the Egel Azov and just want to introduce it by saying it is one of the most misunderstood parshios in the entire Torah. It's totally misunderstood. And I'll explain that later. But in the meantime, we can all agree that the golden calf is a black mark on the history of the Jewish people. You imagine? Oh. Coming out of Mitzrayim, being led out of Egypt by God himself, seeing the plagues in Egypt, seeing the splitting of the sea and all the wonders that happened there. And according to the Haggadah, which we're going to be reading in a few weeks, there were 250 miracles happening at the sea. After all this, they come to our Sinai. They're prepared for the receiving of the Torah. On the 40th day, the Eight Sahara comes along and creeps into their heads. And before you know it, they're worshiping the golden calf. How does a thing like this happen? So it's a black mark on the history of the Jewish people. As I said, it's mostly misunderstood. And I'm going to explain that later. But in the meantime, anyone who has a cursory reading of the Parsha is struck by the unbelievable turnabout of loyalty that the Jews should have demonstrated and possessed to go worship a golden calf. We ask ourselves very often, we have to ask ourselves, what would we have done under those circumstances? Would we be amongst those who worship the golden calf? Would we do such a thing? In fact, we can ask ourselves, do we do such things? Do, do we see the awesome gifts that Hashem gives us and then turn around and, and worship something of a physical nature? I'll leave that for you to answer on your own. But the fact is that the Jewish people did just that, and it's a black mark on the history of the Jewish people. Now, one thing we should know, we're going to see later on, that when it comes to the gathering of the Jewish people to fight against those who worship the golden calf, Moshe Rabbeinu says, Mila Hashem Eli. Who is to God? Come to me. Thy yes, who I love, called me Levi. And who came to him? All the people of Levi. Now, the tribe of Levi contains two separate entities. One entity is the Kahanim, who came from the tribe of Levi, because Aaron is the brother of Moshe, and from him came the Kahanim. And the other is the Levian, that also came from the tribe of Levi. So you have Kahanim and Levian coming from the tribe of Levi, and not one, not one, not one single member of the tribe of Levi. No Kohen and no Levi worshipped the golden calf. The other tribes, there were some few members, perhaps, of each and every tribe. But when it came to the tribe of Levi, there was not a one, not a Kohen, not a Levi, that gave in to worship the golden calf. Ah, now we understand. When you call someone up to the Torah for Aliyah number one, who are you calling up? You're calling up the Kohen. And when you call up the second person for Aliyah number two, who are you calling up? You're calling up the Levi. And when you read the portion of the Kohen and the portion of the Levi, you're reading about 
the golden calf. Imagine if you called up a Yisrael whose ancestors might have been amongst the rest of the tribes of Israel that worship the golden calf. After he gets the Aliyah, he comes down off the bima, And all the people go over to him and say, Yashikayach, you got the Aliyah of the golden calf. You know why? Because your ancestors were doing it. Yeah, no wonder they gave you that Aliyah. You're one of those guys. They can't say that about the Kohen, and they can't say that about the Levi. And our Kodesh Baruch and Chazal wanted to ensure that we are so sensitive to the feelings of each and every Jew that an Aliyah that might imply, even though, of course, it's not so, but even if it just gives a little hint of wrongdoing, it's going to be a tremendous insult to any member of Klai Yisrael. And consequently, no Yisrael is to get the Aliyah of the Golden Calf. Instead, we take the Sedra and skewer it so that the first 91 Psukim, which include the Golden Calf, is only going to be given to a Kohen or to a Levi and no one else. The sensitivity that this is teaching us is of such value that without even going into the wording of the Sedja, we already have a deep insight into the J Jewish people's essence by virtue of the care and concern for the feelings of others that each and every Jew must inculcate within him or herself. And now we go to the second issue in this Sedja. It says, first of all, I want you to know, and I'm not going to go deep into this, I just want you to know that there is a logic to the words ki tiso esos b'nei Yisrael l'fkudehem. When you count the Jewish people, it uses the expression of ki tisa. Now, literally, it means a, a count. But the word tisisa literally means lift up. Lift up. You know, you've got 603,550 Jews males between the age of 21 and 50 or 60 and you have women and children you know you could think to yourself I'm, I'm unimportant i don't count i'm just a cog in the wheel i'm just unimportant along comes the torah and said don't think like that that's not the way you look at life you're to lift up when you count each Jew, you are to count each Jew and look at each Jew and say, this Jew counts. You count. You are important. Lift up your head. You're a Jew. Be proud. You're one of Hashem's army. It's not just you're a number. You're not just part of a greater whole. But without you, there wouldn't be that greater whole. You are so crucial. You are so important. Lift up. And that's why the expression of counting is kiti so. Now, I don't want to go into the discussion of the way they were counted because I want to move on to another important issue that comes up a little bit after this particular thing. And we're going to go straight down and we're going to go to the next section, which is starting with Pasuk Yud Zion. It says here, and by the way, this is a piece of the Torah that those of us who daven every morning in the part of the davening in the morning that includes the Karbanos, we read this Parsha. This is called the Parsha of the Kior, the Parsha of the Wash Basin. As it says, by Dav Hashem Moshe Lema, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, it's from the very beginning of the Sedja, you should make a wash, a wash basin of copper, the Khanonakoshes, and its base of copper, Lirachza, for the sake of washing. And you should put it between the oil moed and between the Mizbeach, and you put water in that wash basin. 
And the Pesach says, When they came to do any of the avodah, they have to wash their hands and feet. When they come to the Oel Moi, they should wash with water. Now look at this. So they won't die. Because if they do the avodah without washing their hands and feet, it's like committing a capital crime. When you bring any of the fire offerings to God. And it should be a chop olam lo umazaro ledoro son. This is an everlasting statute. Now, I want you to know that our Chazal have taught us a very interesting analogy. I'm going to give you an analogy. The Kohen is to the Jewish people what the Jewish people are to the world. A Kohen is an example for the Jewish people, and the Jewish people are the Kohanim of the world. That's why it says in Parshish Yisro, Vatem Tihiyuli Mamleches Kohanim. You are to be for me a kingdom of Kohanim. Now, and many of the point out, including Rav Shachar Ferlesh, that the word Kohen comes from the word Kivun, which means direction. We're giving direction, just like the Kohen gives direction, so do we. I had a friend uh, when I was younger, we used to walk to yeshiva, and next door to the yeshiva was a funeral home. And it had an awning coming out of the funeral home. And this friend of mine was not a Kohen, he was a Yisrael, but he would never walk under the canopy of the funeral home. And I, I, used to, I once said to him, I said, Mesh, I don't understand, why, why don't you, you're not a Kohen, why, why don't you just keep going? He said, listen, Maish, what's good for the Kohen is good for the Yisrael. I'm not walking under the canopy. I don't want to walk under the funeral home. Okay, but really there's something to this. Because what's happening over here is that before the Kohen can do any avoda, he's told to wash his hands. Chazal tell us that based on these psukim, be, the second we get up in the morning, the first thing we do is wash the tilas yadayim. Just like the Kohen, before he did any avoda, he washed the tilas yadayim. Okay, he washed Raglayim too, but we just wash the tilas yadayim. By the way, what does the tilas yadayim mean? Many people, I think, are under the impression that the word the tilas yadayim means the washing of the hands. But natila doesn't mean washing. Natila does not mean washing. You can unmute if you'd like to answer. What does natila mean? Al natilas yadayim. He commanded us about natilas yadayim. It doesn't to mean use, washing. To use? Taking away. It means to use? Taking away. Taking, taking, right? Taking. Take Taking. taking away the the tumor. Not taking away. Well, okay. Uh, 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 David's saying taking away the impurity. Is that what you mean? Yes. Okay, but it means taking, right? Natila means taking of something. All right, right. It could mean taking away. It could also mean taking for. Before we do anything from the second we arise in the morning on, you, Jew, take your hands, the actions that you possess, take your power and dedicate it to the one and only HaKadosh Baruch Hu, just like the Kohanim, before they did the Avodah, because what you're doing in your life is an Avodah. What you do with your life is avodah Hashem. You get up in the morning and you go to shul and you put on tefillin, you say moda ani. You go to work, you raise your children, you interact with your neighbors, you have shalom bias. You, who do everything, you give tzedakah, you daven, 
You've got to work in our honest and business. What you're doing is avoda. It's holy work. You're raising your children. You're making them happy. You're giving them a source of intelligence and a purpose in life. That's Hashem's avoda. In order to do that avoda, you got to take your hands and look at them in the morning and say to yourself, Baruch atah Hashem alakeinu melech olam. Asher kedushanu, you made us holy like the kahanim. The mitzvah sav. With his commandments, with Sivanu, and you commanded us, on the tilas yadayim, on the taking of our hands and making our lives meaningful and worthwhile, and taking good care of ourselves, and taking good care of our neighbors, and taking care not to insult anybody and give him a golden calf aliyah that he doesn't deserve. We're taking the tilas yadayim. We're taking our hands. So at the very beginning, before you can get to the golden calf, before, before you can do anything, you have to remember that you're like a Kohen, you know? And you and, and you got to take the tilas you're dying. You, you, have, you have to do. You have to do what's necessary to be done in order to be able to, to make the day worthwhile because you're about to do the avoda. Because the tilas you're is an avoda. I want to show you a very interesting puzzle, which uh, was a little bit hinted to just a moment ago. But I want to show you something. If you take a look, I'm going to try another share and see if we can't get this particular share now. That will help us a little bit with explaining this particular section that I'd like to do. This is not going to work because this is not it. OK, let's see if we can get it. I'm going to try something. Be patient. I'll be right back. Don't go away. I hope I can get you back after I do this. I, I'm sure I will be able to. So let's see. Okay. Uh, here we go. Uh, nah, 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 nah. Ah, here we go. Okay. Uh, let's get back right now. Um, there we go. I got it. How do you like that? It worked. All right. We're going to try to get another share now, and we'll see if we can't get this one. I don't know if we got it. We'll try. Yeah, here it is. Okay, here it comes. Okay. In in Devarim, in Perik Chaf Aleph, it speaks about the case of the Egla Arufa. Okay. The Egla Arufa is where someone is killed in between two cities and you don't know who killed him. You're not sure about who the murderer is. So the the Pasik tells us in here we are in the Pera Kabbalah from Pasik, hey, it says the Kahanim. The B'nai Levi, look at that, the Kahana B'nai Levi, which we spoke about at the beginning of the Sejah, uh, they know that Hashem chose them to serve him and to bless his name, and that everything is going to be settled through their teachings. And all the elders of the city that are close to this dead body, they all come out. Now watch what it says. Yerchatsu es yedehem. They are to wash their hands. Al ha'egla ha'arufa banacho on the calf that they break its neck in that valley. And they are to answer and say, Our hands did not spill this blood. So the word Yerchatsu, we wash our hands from it, is an expression of getting rid of an undesirable quality something that you don't want. Now we can go back to our original puzzle. And now we can take a look and we can see, whoops, I hope I can get it, no? It disappeared from view. All right, we'll get back to it in a second. Uh, what we wanna do is we wanna realize that when we come to our original puzzle, which is over here, we'll get to it in a second, okay? 
So we are here now. We can get it now. Right. We're back here. All right. We're gonna, we're gonna get the share now. It's right over here. All right. Now we see the person. Okay. It says when they come to the to the key or vedocha to yudayim raglayim, they're to wash their hands and feet. So there are two purposes. We gave an explanation. One of them was in order to take your hands and elevate them. But there's another purpose. And that purpose is the rachatsu means to get rid of something. Wash your hands of it. Wash your hands of that which you don't want to have anything to do with. When a, someone is sleeping at night, they're not exercising free will. In fact, the neshama actually leaves them. And they are not voluntarily moving. They're sleeping. We need sleep. HaKadosh Baruch Hu created sleep so that we can rejuvenate. Uh, with emphasis on the Jew part of rejuvenate. Yeah. So, so we're sleeping and we're, we're not in charge. Yechatsu Yudeya. Yechatsu Yudeya Wash away that part of life in which you are out of control and which you are not in charge of things, but rather wake up and realize that you can take your hands and put yourself in a position where you are in control and not suffering from a lack of control. I, know, I promise that we're going to get to the discussion of the golden calf, and I want to do that right now. There's a lot more to discuss that I wanted to do to get there before that, but because of the amount of time that we have in order to uh, to accomplish what we want, we're going to we're going to go to the issue of the golden gate. Okay. There's a lot going on over here, and it's very difficult because, as I said, golden calf is a black mark on the history of the Jewish people. Before we get to the psukim, which we're about to see. Let's ask us. And if you know the answer, because you've heard me ask this question before, please don't give the answer. I'd like the people who have joined us for this year and who haven't heard me ask this question before to respond. I, I, so, um, so you can unmute yourself. In fact, I, I can actually do that too. All right. And then unmute everybody for, for the purpose. Whoops. Gotta be careful here. I may make a mistake and lose everybody. You don't want to do that. Where's purpose? Where's my purpose? Oh my goodness. Something happened already. All right. Let's go back and see if we can't find it over here. It's going to come up in a second. It's up here somewhere. Ah, there it is. Okay, good. All right. I'm going to unmute everybody. All right. Uh, I can find the unmute button. Uh, I guess. I'm asking everybody to unmute. You can. Um, um, yeah, unmute yourself, sir. You can unmute yourself at this point. Okay. So what I want to do, what I want to do now, I'm going to ask you a question, and everyone who's uh, every everyone who's on this, uh, we'll come back to the share soon. Everyone who's on this uh, video today, Baruch Hashem, we have quite a few participants over here. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question, and, and you can respond. You can respond unless you unless you've heard me ask this question. Okay, based on the way we understand the issue of the golden calf, in your opinion, in your opinion logical thinking opinion. What percentage of the Jewish people, based on the way the golden calf is spoken about and the way we've understood the terrible Avera, the black mark on our history of the golden calf, what percentage of the Jewish people worship the golden calf? A third. A third, thirty-three no. percent. Okay. Yeah, because because not the Levium and not the Kahanim. Okay, so that's that's one tribe. Okay, 
But, but not all these well, not, not, not all these well, Israel. Okay, but so, so the barrel says 33% worship the golden yeah. chair. So that means it's a minority, yeah. right? You're saying the barrel that it was a minority that worshiped the golden chair, right? Okay. That's what you're saying. Anybody else have well, any? They could be more Israel than Kahneman and Olivia. Okay, okay. The barrel's opinion was 33%. Anybody else? Okay. I would say a very small percentage because not everybody left uh, Mitzrayim. So no, I'm talking about the ones who left Mitzrayim. What percentage of the oh, ones who I'll left say Mitzrayim? A very small percentage, maybe two percent. Very, very, less, very, of, the ones, of the ones who left Egypt, only two percent. Yeah, because the Arab Rav or whatever the troublemakers said didn't make it out of Mitzrayim. They wanted to stay. So I would say most. No, they died. Of the, they died. These they, the ones who came to Mount Sinai were yeah. the best of the best. That's right. right. That's okay. why I'm saying so, a very but, small... But they worship the golden calf, right? Yeah, the small percentage. So what percentage? I would say less than 1%. Less than 1%. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, isn't it true that the women did not contribute to the, to the making of the golden calf? Yes, that is true. The women did not contribute to the making of the golden calf. But, no. of, the, they, but they, of the 6,000... 550 men who did, right? What percentage worship the golden calf? That's my question. You're right, the women did not. And if you want, I will try to, I'll give, but how, we have Bertha Jones, some women on this. On this, It's very important to, to take a, a piece of encouragement uh, for the ladies in this particular issue, okay? And I'll try to explain that if we have a chance. Let's go back to the percentages. What percentage? So we have 33, we have less than one. Anybody else? No. What, anybody less, else with a percentage? Less than one. Anybody else with a percentage of, of what you believe that over the history, when you learned about this, we learned all about it, we hear about it. We hear about the terrible, terrible golden calf. What percentage? Okay, if you don't want to say it's all right, no problem. I want you to know that when I ask this question generally in an informal session, in the, in the class or uh, in the young Israel itself, uh, it's a class in the young Israel or a class in yeshiva, uh, class of adults, it doesn't really matter where. Generally, the percentages range anywhere from 80% because it was a stock mark against the Jewish people. And it seemed like all of them, I mean, after all, God is going to wipe out whoever, you know, uh, worship the golden calf. And not only is he going to wipe out of where worse the golden calf? But he wanted to change and get rid of the entire nation and only make Moshe Rabbeinu into a new nation and leave Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov alone. These guys are not worthy. So, so a lot of people say a lot of percentages. They say 80%, 90%, 70%, 50%, 60%, 30%. percent they all say that. Meyer is pretty good. He said less than 1%. The truth of the matter is, I was saying, this is a statistic you should try to remember. Try to remember this. The actual numbers, the number of Jews that worshiped the golden calf were one tenth of one percent of the Jewish people. Yeah, you got it right. <laughs> one that's, tenth that's, yeah. of one percent. That's of one one hundredth, right? One one hundredth, right? Oh, that, means, oh, one, right? that means if there were 3 million Jews, which we estimate there were at that time, one ten of 1%, 3,000 worship the golden here. Out of 3 million, a total of 3,000. So the first thing we have to be aware of is that this is not what the world would like to think. The Jewish people, 99.999% did not worship the golden calf. You understand? Mm. That's the first thing. The next question you have to ask is, well, if so few worship the golden calf, why is it such a black mark on our heritage? Why does it say that Hashem said, I'll never forget this golden calf, and you guys are going to suffer the consequences of it 
throughout all of history, as we'll see in the Pesukim. How could such a thing be? If so, they didn't protest. Yeah. What? They didn't protest. Listen to this. They didn't protest. They didn't protest. Mordechai has been it's, in the theater once before. The royal Aravens up there. Aravens up there. Okay. There is a Gemara in the Sefer Shabbos, which we are learning on Shabbos, and maybe we'll take a look at it at the end of the year on Shabbos. On Daflon Hein and Vav. It talks about the para of Rabbi Loza ben Azari. There's a Mishnah that says, and talking about what an animal is allowed to wear, to carry on Shabbos. Now, you know, there's a law that not only must you rest on Shabbos, yeah. but even your behemoth has to rest on Shabbos. A Jew cannot put this animal to work on Shabbos. If the animal wants to graze and rip out grass from the ground, we don't tell him, hey, no ripping out grass from the ground. No, we can't. No, we don't have to do that. But, but we can't make the animal work. We have to make, let the animal rest on Shabbos. Yet the Gemara says, the calf of Rebbe Lozab and Azariah went out with a Ritsua Sheben Kaileo. She had a fancy red bendel around her horns, and she walked out with it. The, the, the cow that was owned by Rebbe Lozab and Azariah went out with the ribbon in her hair, which she's not allowed to wear because it's a carrying. You're not allowed to have your animal carry anything on Shabbos. Yeah. So the Gemara says, "Paraso she Rebbe Lozab and Azariah Yotza." He went against the rules of the Chachamim. They should never, he should never have allowed it. So the Gemara asked, wait a minute. If the rabbis didn't allow it, how could Rebbe Lozab and Azariah allow his cow to go out with a red bendel around its horns? The Gemara answers, it wasn't his cow. <laughs> so if it wasn't his cow, Who why does it say it was his cow? So the Gemara answers, Shahaya biyado limchos velo micha. He didn't want to embarrass him. He to protest, and he didn't protest. He could have protested, and he didn't protest. And the Gemara says, call me Sheyesh Biyodo Limpos. Anyone who has the ability to protest the low Micha and doesn't protest, nit pass gets caught in that sin. If you have the ability to protest and you don't protest, you get caught up. You get caught up in what's going on. Does that mean mocha? Mocha means mocha. to protest. Now, it doesn't mean you can stop it. You know, you can't stop people from doing what they want. And even when it says about protest, you have to be aware. You can't even always protest. Because you don't have to know how to pick your battles. You have to know where you can protest and where you can't protest. There are some things that if you protest, is gonna backfire. So you're better off not protesting and choosing where you can protest. That's different from Asra. Yes, much different, much different. When a person, when, when, a, when a person is accosted by another person, telling them a juicy piece of gossip which they shouldn't hear there's a way for you to protest without saying, get out of here, you balosh and hara, and insulting the person. You can easily cut it off another way. You say, by the way, did you hear about this, this new store that opened that's giving away free samples of, of a forum today? You know, change the subject. There is a way without 
insulting. So, so when it comes to, and even a parent, parents have to know when to protest and when not to protest. Some things are better off left unsaid. But when you can, and the Gemara there felt where Beloza ben Azar, you could have protested, and he didn't. If you don't protest, you get caught up in it. Here, you have one tenth of one percent of the Jews worshiping the golden calf. Why are the other 99.99% accused of doing the wrong thing? Because they could have protested. They were the majority. They could have said, no, don't do this. Don't do this. Stand up for what's right. It doesn't mean you have to be violent. It just means you have to voice protest when it is right to protest. And of course, when it comes to protest, it doesn't mean that you're going to bring sticks and axes and knives and guns and destroy a building in protest. I have a, I have no, a that's comment. not what it means. Protesting means, you know, you're really not supposed to talk in davening, guys. You know, I mean, really, you know. I, I, I want to daven with this minion, but you know, I mean, you know, you, you know, excuse me, I have to move away. I, I, I can't, I, I can't concentrate. Rabbi Snow, yeah. I have a question. Uh, did, didn't Aaron, Aaron didn't protest. He was stalling, but he didn't protest. Okay, that was his story. So is he, where does he fall in? Good, good point, good point, good point. But Aaron did protest, yeah. it, it, except that his, and here, that's instructive, because sometimes the protest is not by saying you're doing something wrong. The protest is by allying yourself with somebody and showing them through other methods that what you're doing is not really acceptable, okay? It's not really acceptable, okay? And, and Aaron tried to do that. By the way, it should be noted that nowhere in Parshas Kisiso or anywhere else do we find that because of Aaron's actions, the kahuna was taken away from him. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu knew that he did everything he could. He was not accused of not protesting. Because he did what he could have done. As we'll see from the Pesukim if we get a chance. Okay, so... The first thing we have to be aware of is that the black mark of the golden calf against the Jewish people is exaggerated. It's way out of proportion. And the way to prove that is by taking a look at almost any of the other Averos that the Jewish people had when a terrible result took place. One of the prime examples of that is when they worshiped Baal Pa'or later on in Chumash Bamidbar at the end of Parshas Balak. 24,000 Jews died in the plague of Baal Pa'or. Eight times as many as died mm. by the golden calf. But you don't hear people saying, oh, you know, that Baal Pa'or business, that was, that was really a bad downfall of the Jewish people. 24,000 died. Nobody brings it up. Nobody says anything about it. Because Hashem made a big deal about the golden calf because there was something elementally problematic that the people did not protest when they could have. And that's a black mark on our history. Let's try to take a look at some of the psukim and actions that took place at that time. Didn't, didn't, didn't Horpa protest? Uh, there, there, there were, there were oh. some people that were killed if we have a chance to get to that, we will. But we, I want to focus on a different point. Good point, David. Thank you very much. Chor lost his life because of this. That's true. Okay. All right. We're gonna we're gonna go to the share again, and I wanna I wanna show you something. All right. I wish I had time to bring up the famous statement by the Vilna Gaon, which showed how valuable the women were, that not one woman was involved in it. He, he quotes uh, Gemara, which says, 
It's not a Gemara. It's a Pasuk, actually, in Kahelis. The Pasuk in Kahelis says um, a language the Isha v'chol Ela Adam Echad Here's the Pasuk in Kahelis. It goes like this. Adam Echad may elef Matsasi. One, one, one male among the nation I did find. The Isha Bechol Ele. But a woman amongst all these, Lo Matsasi, I didn't find. And many people think that Shlomo HaMelech was saying a put down about ladies. But the Vilna Gaon points out that it's just the opposite. Adam Echad Me Elef Matsasi. One person, about a thousand, one male of a thousand I did find. One tenth of one percent. I did find who worshiped the golden calf. The Isha Bechol Eile, but a woman amongst anyone who said, Eile Elohecha Yisrael. Right? Look, look what the Pasuk says. Look what the Pasuk says. The Pasuk says, right? Watch what the Pasuk says. Uh, Pasuk says, let, I want to show you that Pasuk. It says, uh, let's see if we can find the passage where it says that. It's in here, right here. Back here, 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 Go back, 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 back. Go more. Okay, here it goes. Watch this. It says they made a, a molten golden calf. Vayomru, and they said, Ela Elohecha Yisrael. This, these are the gods of the Jewish people. It says, the Isha of the Chol Ela, a woman amongst anyone who said, Ela Elohecha Yisrael, Lo Matsasi. I didn't find one woman who worshiped the golden kid. And that's where it's based on, based on that plus. Anyway, let's go further now and let's see what happens over here. Let's see what happens. I want you to see what Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu. All right? Hashem speaking to Moshe. He says, Lech raid. Go down. Your, your nation has become destructive. It's interesting. Moshe, Moshe could have said, my nation, what? Well, he's your nation too. You know how it is. You always blame. Your know. nation that you took out of Egypt. And Chazal tell us it's the first of Erev Rav. They quickly turned away from the path I commanded them. They made a molten graven image. This is the God that took you out of Egypt. Okay? All right? You got this? Okay, so Hashem says, go down, look what they did. Look what they did. You got a stiff necked people here. By the way, that's one of the greatest attributes of the Jewish people. We're very, very stubborn. So the Atah and now, leave me alone. The Ichara people I'm going to wipe them out. There it says, I'm going to make you into a great nation. And then it says, Now, why did Moshe Davin Hashem? Hashem said, I'm going to wipe them out. Why did he Davin? Because Hashem gave him an opening. And here is a key point. Hashem said, And now please leave me alone. Leave me be. So I'm going to get angry at them and kill them. And Moshe says the Gemara and Bracha said to himself, what do you mean? God is saying to me, leave me be? Do I have any hold on God? I have no hold on God. Why is he saying, and now leave me be? I'll tell you why he said that to me. Because he wants me to hold on to him and not let him do this. He wants me to daven for the Jewish people. He wants me to supplicate before him so that I find an excuse 
not to destroy the Jewish people. Do you ever read the Pasuk in this Moshiach Hanukkah, Sabayas the David, where David Amelech is Davidi to Hashem, and he says, Ma betzabidomi, Benidati El Shachas. What value is there going to be to destroy me that I should go down to be destroyed? If I turn to dust, will the dust praise you? Is it going to tell about your truth? Dovin HaMelech says, Avig the Miller is teaching us that when we daven, give concrete reasons. Keep me alive because I can praise you. Moshe comes to Hashem, he said, hey, what are you going to get angry at them? Why should the Goyim say you took them out to destroy them and to make them into nothing? I'm giving you excuses not to destroy them. Remember what happened to Avram, the Yitzchak, the Yisrael, Avadecha, Asher is battle and Boch, but the Dabra Lam are bezar, you said you're going to make their nation like the stars in the sky. They're going to be shining lights. And you're going to give the land of Israel to them. And watch what happens. You daven? And you know what Hashem says? Good gedaven. You were supposed to daven. That's what you were supposed to do. I was waiting for that. I was waiting for that. And you'll say, but I daven already. Daven some more. You know what David Amelo said? Kave El Hashem. Have hope in God. And the hope didn't come to fruition. Chazak the Ametzli Lecha. Strengthen and fortify your heart. The Kave El Hashem. And continue to have even more hope in Hashem. Okay. So, so Hashem is telling Moshe things are really bad down there. You know, the whole thing is a terrible scene and they're screaming and yelling. Okay, watch this. When Moshe Rabbeinu comes to the camp, it says, He sees the golden gate. And he sees the dancing. He sees the Egel and the dancing. And Moshe takes the luchos and breaks them. I want to ask you a question. Hashem, a few psukim back, said, Moshe, get down there, because your nation has become destructive. They've gone away from the path I told them. They made for them a melting golden calf. Go down and take a look. Does Moshe break the, break the luchos? No, he doesn't break the luchos. Yeah. He doesn't break the luchos. Why didn't he break them? What, he didn't trust God? Hey, listen, maybe, maybe you're making a mistake. Maybe they're not really doing it. Are you kidding? This is the Rebidish that I'm talking here. How come he didn't break them right away? You know when he broke them? He saw it with his own eyes. I can't believe you did that. Even when Hashem told me you did it, and I knew that he was right. I couldn't believe you did that. I have to see it. I can't believe it. He had such a moon and trust in the righteousness and goodness of the Jewish people. He couldn't believe that someone would do this. And the Jewish people have to repay that trust. We have to regain that trust. That the Jewish people are righteous people. We are faithful people, the children are faithful people. We are the children of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. We're the children 
who are the future of the next generation. And that future, Hashem says, can be very, very bright. Now, there's one more thing I really want to get to before we end tonight, even though it's very late. I want to show you something that was taught by Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky from a, a, a series of psukim that uh, are really very, very crucial. Hashem is talking to uh, Moshe and Moshe is talking to Hashem. And Moshe says the following words. Here it is, right here in Pasuk Yudches. Moshe is talking to Hashem. Look what he's saying. Vayoma. Moshe Rabbeinu is talking to God. And he says, Hareini no eskivodecha. Show me your glory. Show me your honor. I want to see you, God face to face. I want to see the essence of Hashem. In fact, the Gemara and Brachis on this Pasuk says, Moshe Rabbeinu said, teach me how to explain one of the greatest conundrums on earth. Sadik Viralo. Russia, the Tovlo. Teach me your honor. Show me your glory. I want to understand why the wicked prosper at times, only at times, and why the good, righteous suffer at times. I want to know why that happens. So Hashem answers him. Vayomer lo sucha liros esponai. You cannot see my face. Why? Ki lo yir ani ha'adam v'chay. Because no human being can see me and live. Of course not. You're not alive if you don't have free will. If you see the face of God and lose your free will because you must obey due to your knowledge, empirical, face to face, you can't exist. It's because you have free will that you exist. No one's going to be able to see me and live, but I'll tell you what I will do for you. Listen to what I will do, says Hashem. And Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky translates the Pesukim like this. I want you to come next to me. Stand by the rock. And I'm going to pass by, and you're going to be able to see my glory a little bit, but... I'm going to put you in the cleft in the rock. And I'm going to cover your face until I pass. So you're not going to see me coming because you can't see my face. But you're going to be in the cleft in the rock. And I'm going to cover over that rock until I pass. And once I pass, I'm going to remove my palm. You'll see my back. You won't see my face. Says Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky. We can never predict the future. We can never see God coming. We can never see what the future holds. And God does not reveal to us why the righteous at times suffer and why the bad sometimes prosper. But after the fact, after the events have taken place and you look back in history, you begin to see a pattern 
And you will see that the God of Hashem, Hashem was with the Jewish people every single step of the way. Every single step of the way. Tabosai, what are the mathematical possibilities and probabilities of the Jewish people still being alive and kicking today, considering every single powerful nation has endeavored to do everything they can to destroy the Jewish people. What are the percentages of the Jewish peoples possibly continuing to exist under these circumstances? The probability is next to zero. Next to zero. But we're here. We're here because of the divine guidance of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Chloda Uva Atzmo, because he's watching over the Jewish people. And he's watching over each and every Jew. And even though there are times when never such good people have so much sorrows. And even though there are times where bad people seem to be running away with life and having a blast while they're full of sin. It's not so. It's not so at all. Wait and see. Wait and see. And if you don't see today, you'll see tomorrow. And if you don't see tomorrow, you'll see the next day. Maybe you'll see 100 years in the future. Maybe 200 years in the future. We don't know. But one thing we do know. Hashem is eternal. The Jewish people is eternal. And the Torah is eternal. And as long as the combination of those three are existing, we have nothing to fear. And that's why Hashem says to Moshe, you're not going to see my face, but I'll let you see after the fact. After the fact, study the history, and you'll see. It's his story. It's up to Hashem. And it's up to the Jewish people to recognize and to see God in all this. And to recognize that we have responsibility to do everything we can to interact with our fellow Jews to help make them better so that the world becomes better. Because if we have the opportunity to protest and we don't, then we're a bit at fault. And it's important that we don't come under those circumstances. We want to do the best we can to be positive and to support the continued future of Kali Yisrael. Pasha's Kisis is a very, very powerful Pasha. There's a lot more. Believe me, there's a lot more. I wish we had more time. And as usual, we always need more time. But we did the best we can under the circumstances. And yet, Hashem, next week we'll continue. Now, I'm going to give, even though it's very, very late, I'm going to give five minutes. Are there any questions on Pesach preparations now that anyone would like to ask? Okay, so we'll leave it. If you have any questions during the week, please write me. Send me an email. Rabbi Sheleg, R-A-B-B-I-S-H-E-L-E-G, at gmail.com. Sheleg is snow. It's easy to remember. Rabbi Sheleg at gmail.com. Tell me your question. And if I get it, before next Thursday, Sheer, and we can give you the proper answer, we will do everything we can to respond in an intelligent fashion. I'm going to spend some time on Hilchas Pesach each of the next few weeks and also on the Haggadah. So we're going to encapsulate the Parsha with Pesach. Okay, any questions, comments? Thank Have a great Shabbos, everybody. Thank you. Have a good Shabbos. Good job. Thank you. Good job, everyone. You all be gesund. Wow, what a great opportunity to learn together with so many wonderful people. It's really a gift that we have, that we have this Zoom to be able to learn with. Thank you so much all for joining with us and have a wonderful Shabbos. Thank you. Thank you.